Hi, I'm Dan Cardipassi. Welcome to DCC Shop. In this episode, I'm going to install a Loksound 5 DCC and sound decoder along with a speaker and power pack into an HO scale Proto 2000 060 steam locomotive. Unlike my model building series where I focus on a complete build of a model including paint, details, and DCC, this show is going to be mostly about DCC installations. I'm going to try to keep external work on the model to a minimum. This model is a little unusual for this show in that it's already taken apart. That's because I bought it off eBay years ago and the seller misrepresented the condition of the model. The smoke box, cab size, and cab roof had been repainted badly and the original tender was in pieces. The previous owner had swapped a different tender, but it was a poor quality model in bad condition. The engine ran really well though, so I put it aside thinking I'd fix it later. I recently ran across the engine and thought it was time to do something with it. I selectively stripped the bad paint in areas that needed it and touched up the model. I also built a freelanced custom oil bunker for the original tender using styrene and Archer rivet decals. Since USRA engines weren't common on the west coast, I didn't have a specific prototype in mind for it. I decided to letter it for my fictitious north coast. None of these cosmetic fixes would be necessary on an engine that was in better condition to begin with. The original headlights for this model used a goofy light pipe arrangement and bulbs. The lights were very dim and didn't look realistic. I decided to upgrade the lights using some brass castings I had in my stash of detail parts. I like headlights to look realistic when they're off as well as on. This can be a little difficult with larger light castings like the ones I picked for this model. Unlike small lenses for diesels that can be made with fiber optics, these headlight castings need something bigger. In the past I've used MV lenses with a small hole drilled in the back for an LED. These are okay, but I don't like the yellowish color and I'm not sure if they're still in production. I decided to try something new. I found these 5mm acrylic rods on Amazon. These are just a little larger around than the headlight opening. I'm going to use this material to make my own combination lens and reflector. I've cut a short length of rod and put it in a drill. Now I can spin the drill and file the rod down to size. The end of the rod now fits into the first part of the opening. The headlight casting steps down in size, creating a lip that would hold a flat round lens. I've put some tape around the rod so that I can file just the end a little more. Now the rod steps down in size. It's still a little too long, but it fits inside the casting. I'll continue using files to shape the end of the rod into a cone. When I'm happy with the shape, I'll start polishing it with progressively finer grades of sandpaper, starting with 320 grit and working my way up to 1500. After polishing, I'll cut the newly made lens from the rest of the rod. Again using progressively finer grades of sandpaper, this time on plate glass, I'll polish the lens face. Ultra-fine polishing pads like these also work well for this job. I got these from Micromark. These two are 8,000 and 12,000 grit. This is the finished lens after sanding and polishing the front. It fits perfectly into the headlight casting. The next step is to drill the back of the lens for an LED. I'll be using a 603 sized warm white surface mount LED with my own leads attached. If you want to see how I prepare LEDs, please check out SP Consist Build Part 8 LED Primer on this channel. I deliberately left a flat spot in the center on the back of the lens. I'll start by drilling a pilot hole with a number 78 drill bit, taking care to make sure that the drill bit stays centered. I'm only drilling part way into the lens. It only has to be deep enough for the 603 LED. I'll follow along with some progressively larger drill bits to expand the hole. I'll finish with a number 54 drill bit. Now I'll put a tiny drop of canopy glue into the hole and attach the LED. This glue will dry clear. Once the glue is dry, I'll paint the back of the lens silver. I ended up messing up the first lens a little, so I made another one. This one is the same, except that to save time, I used a 603 LED with pre-soldered leads. In fact, I made two since I also needed one for the backup light. I labeled them one and two since the headlight castings I'm using are close but not exactly the same, and each lens is custom fit. Especially with a newer experimental technique, it's not unusual for something not to work out perfectly the first time. The good thing about fabricating your own parts is that if you made it once, you can make it again. The more you do it, the easier it'll get. I really like the way this lens looks, both when it's off and when it's on. Now that the lights are ready, I can install them in the castings. I drilled a small hole for the wires in the back of each headlight casting before painting them. Full disclosure, I made another mistake here in not following my own rule to always use primer. I thought I could get away with it since I used black, but the paint started to rub off as I was working on the headlights. I ended up having to strip and repaint the headlight castings. Trying to cut corners often results in having to do things over, so it's really better to do it right the first time. I'll thread the wires through the hole. Then I'll use a paper clip as an applicator and put a small amount of canopy glue around the inside edge of the casting. 
This glue will dry clear and should allow the lens to be removed in the future if it ever becomes necessary. The plastic uncoupling tool that I use as a pointer is also good for coaxing the light into its final position, since the plastic won't scratch the surface of the lens. It's a good idea to test it again to make sure it works. Looks good. I assembled the backup light in the same way. Now both lights are ready to be installed on the model. From here on out, this is a pretty straightforward DCC install. It's always a good idea to make a plan before starting. The factory connector between the engine and tender has six pins, two for track power, two for the motor, and two for the headlight. If I wanted to put more lights in the locomotive, I'd have to use a secondary connector or find a connector with more pins. This switcher doesn't have any class lights, but I need more wires for a cab light or firebox flicker. I decided that for this model I want to keep things simple, so I'm going to reuse the factory connector and content myself with just the headlights. The decoder and speaker will go inside the tender. I'll be using a Sound 5 DCC decoder for this install and a Soundtrax 27mm Megabase speaker. I haven't used one of these speakers before, so I'm curious to see how it sounds. Generally, the bigger the speaker, the better the results. Since this is a short wheelbase locomotive, I'll also use a Sound power pack to help the engine over any areas of dirty track. This engine was already taken apart, but I still have the original light board and DCC socket. This board, or one similar to it, were also used in a lot of Proto 2000 diesels. My advice with Proto 2000 locomotives is not to use the DCC socket without checking it first. Some of them had the DCC socket wired incorrectly at the factory, and if you just plug in an 8-pin decoder, it'll blow. I found that out the hard way. I'm going to start by mounting the lights I made on the model. The original mounting boxes for the lights were mangled, so I had to make new ones from sheet styrene. I've drilled a pair of holes. The larger one is for the mounting pin on the bottom of the light casting. The smaller one is for the wires. I'll thread the wires through the smaller hole. Then I'll pull them through from the bottom. I've pulled the wires taut until just a short length of wire is visible behind the headlight. This isn't entirely unrealistic, as real lights sometimes have visible wires too. I'll secure the light from the bottom with a drop of CA applied with a paper clip. I've connected the leads to my test battery to make sure I didn't mess anything up while installing the light. So far, so good. I used the same procedure for the front headlight. Now I can paint the exposed parts of the wires black. There isn't that much to do inside the locomotive, so I'll start there. At first I was tempted to run new wires for the headlight, but this mechanism is already set up and the wires are even properly color-coded for DCC. The blue and white wires go to a connector inside the smoke box. The leads from the original bulb were stuck into the holes. In case I ever need to disassemble the locomotive in the future, I thought it might be good to keep the connector so that I can detach the headlight easily. Since I don't have a matching male connector, I'm going to use some 19 thousandths brass wire. It fits snugly enough to stay in the holes, but will still pull out easily. Before I connect the headlight, I'll put the body back on the locomotive. The smoke box fits over the front of the frame, then moves back slightly. Be careful of the sander lines that hang down from the bottom. I'll also need to reconnect some of the plumbing and air pump detail. This piping is made of flexible plastic. I'll temporarily insert the screw that holds the smokestack just to keep things from moving around. Another screw is under the back of the cab. After reinserting the pilot, the last screw is between the steam cylinders. Since it's not obvious, I'm using a multimeter to figure out which wire goes to which hole in the connector. The blue wire, the positive common, is on the left. I'm going to clip the headlight leads a little shorter. I've soldered a short piece of 19 thousandths wire to the red wire, which is the positive from the LED. It occurred to me that there's a possibility I could blow the front headlight LED and have to do it all over again if I mess something up while working on the tender. To prevent that, instead of 19 thousandths wire, I'm soldering a 470 ohm resistor to the negative lead. The resistor will help to protect the LED in case it ever gets full track voltage. I'll plug the brass wire and the resistor into the connector. After tucking the wires into the smoke box, I'll test the light again using the connector on the rear of the locomotive. Now I can put the smoke box front back on the engine. I've removed the screw from the smokestack location and I'm using it to attach the stack. Finally, I'll need to reinstall the two-piece cover for the electrical connector. These parts are essential because they also form the mechanical connection between the locomotive and tender. There is no separate drawbar. One half of the cover fits over the post under the cab at the rear of the engine. The wires for the connector pins should be routed around the post. Then the other half of the connector can be installed and secured with a screw. It took a little fiddling to get this to all go together securely in the way it's supposed to. Before I start installing the decoder and speaker in the tender, I wanted to mention something about the way the engine and tender connectors are wired. The two outside wires are for the engine headlight. The next two wires in from each end are for the motor. The two middle wires are for track power. 
If you're wiring a connector for a steam locomotive, pairing the wires in this way is very smart because if the plug somehow ends up reversed, the worst that will happen is that the LED light won't work and the engine will run backwards. If the connector were wired some other way, say with both track power wires on one side and both headlight wires on the other, then if the plug were reversed, the headlight could be blown because it would be getting track power from the tender. Installing a resistor like I did should protect against that, but it's more foolproof to pair the wires the way the factory did in this case. The speaker I'm using is fairly deep front to back, but it's still small enough to fit inside the tender shell. I've placed all the components near the tender chassis and shell, and it looks like there should be more than enough room. I'm not going to use the contact strips and other parts that the previous owner transferred to the other tender. The copper contact strips were made to engage the studs from the tender trucks, but I think the connection will be more reliable if I solder wires directly to the studs. I'll remove the DC light board from the DCC socket. It occurred to me since this engine only has the two headlights and my decoder has an 8-pin plug, I could reuse the DCC socket for all the required connections between the decoder and the model. This will make it easier to swap the decoder at some point in the future if I ever wanted to. I'll still need to hardwire the speaker leads in the power pack, however. This DCC socket appears to be wired correctly, but even if it wasn't, I'd still need to disconnect all the wires to extract the socket and 6-pin connector from the old tender. The mount for the connector on the tender is a little mangled, but it looks like there's still enough of it left to be useful. I had to hunt around for a new screw, but I got the connector mounted. It's important that the order of the wires matches the locomotive. As a test, I connected the tender and locomotive and hooked up my test battery to the blue and white wires that go to the headlight. The headlight's still working. So far, so good. This is what's left of the original tender weight that the previous owner removed and cut down. This part doesn't weigh much, and I think it will just get in the way, so I'm going to discard it. That will leave the tender fairly open so that I have some leeway when mounting the DCC components. Experience has taught me that larger speaker enclosures tend to produce better sound. It occurred to me that the entire tender body could be used as an enclosure. Except for the mangled area where the wires come in, the only holes in it are very small. There's a shelf at the front of the tender body that looks like it'll cover most of the wire hole. I think it should seal pretty well. So my plan is to mount the speaker in such a way that I can use the tender body as an enclosure. If the sound isn't satisfactory, I can always build a styrene box around the back of the speaker later. I like the sound best with the speaker pointed down as it seems to tone down the high frequencies and let more bass come through. I'm going to put the speaker in the center of the tender floor. This will keep it under the oil bunker so that there's a little more room around the back of the speaker. There's a post in the middle of the tender floor that I'll need to remove. With the speaker in position, I'll trace around it with a pencil. The pencil line is barely visible, but good enough to use as a guide. I'll drill a series of sound holes. The whole pattern ended up a little random. I was trying to avoid the brake detail on the underside, so it's also a little asymmetrical. None of this will be visible when the model is on the track. I'm also going to remove the raised areas of the tender floor so that I have a flatter surface to work with. When using a chisel blade, I find it safer to whittle small bits at a time rather than trying to carve off big hunks of plastic all at once. Always make sure the blade is pointed away from you. When I'm done carving, I'll give the area a light sanding. I've made a speaker mount from a piece of 60,000th styrene. I used some CA glue to secure the speaker mount to the tender floor around the sound holes. The liquid styrene cement I normally prefer for plastic to plastic bonds didn't work well on this tender floor. Before gluing this, I checked my clearances. The tender body fits around the floor, so as long as the speaker mount is the same width or less, it will fit. I'm using some clear silicone to secure the speaker. Now I can start wiring the decoder. I've soldered the red and black wires to the studs coming up from the tender trucks. The red wire should be on the right side. I used a little heat shrink tubing to group the wires from the rear truck to keep things neat. At the front I've connected the red and black wires from the trucks to the red and black wires from the connector. I'm using a little heat shrink tubing to keep the connections insulated. Now I can start wiring the DCC socket. This particular 8-pin socket has the pin numbers printed on one side. The proper pin configuration can be found online and in many decoder manuals. The orange wire goes to pin 1, black to pin 4, gray to pin 5, and red to pin 8. That takes care of the motor and track power. Even though I already used a 470 ohm resistor for the front headlight, I'm going to put another one in the tender. That brings the total resistance up to 940 ohms, which is in the 750 to 1k ohm range that I normally use for headlights. I soldered the resistor directly to the pin 6 connection on the DCC socket, then soldered the white wire from the connector to that. I have soldered the blue wire plus an additional length of blue wire to pin 7. Connecting a length of yellow wire to pin 2 completes the socket. Pin 3 isn't used. I'm using a little liquid electrical tape on the back of the DCC socket for some added insurance against shorts. 
I've connected the yellow and the additional blue wire from the connector to the rear headlight. It's hard to see, but there's a 750 ohm resistor where the yellow wire joins the black wire from the LED. I've mounted the DCC socket using some double-sided foam tape. Now I can connect the decoder, being careful not to reverse the plug. I'll solder the brown wires to the speaker. Since there's only one speaker, I don't need to worry about polarity. Before I can attach the power pack, I'll need to carefully trim away some of the shrink wrap around the decoder. I've soldered the wires according to the instructions that came with the power pack. I won't be using the pink and turquoise function leads from the decoder, so I'll cut them short. I've put a little liquid electrical tape over the ends to insulate them. I'm using some double-sided foam tape on the decoder. It fits neatly inside the oil bunker. I've also used some double-sided foam tape to mount the power pack. If this were a freight car at 4 inches long, the NMRA recommended weight would be 3 ounces. Right now it's only at 2.2 ounces, so I want to add a little weight. I found some weights in my scrap box and used some double-sided foam tape to mount them behind the speaker. I used a piece of Kapton tape on the weights to protect against shorting the speaker leads. Now the tender weighs exactly 3 ounces. Getting all the wires into the tender body took some fiddling, but I got it closed up. I didn't have to force the fit, which is good. I downloaded Soundset S0841 from the ESU website. This one was recorded from Western Pacific 060 number 165, not a USRA engine, but probably close enough. The sound set has a choice of 10 different whistles and 5 different bells. Since this is a freelanced engine, I just picked ones that I liked. According to the instructions, in order to get the power pack to work with the Loxound 5 DCC decoder, you need to set the AUX9 output to power pack control. Once I did this, I could lift the engine off the rails and the lights would stay on for a few seconds, confirming that the power pack is working. As a precaution, I disabled all the unused function outputs so that the decoder won't try to send voltage to wires that don't go anywhere. Other than that, I kept most of the default settings. For motor control settings and speed matching, I prefer to use my throttle for programming rather than the loc programmer. That allows me to make adjustments on the fly with the engine running. I would recommend tweaking the motor control CVs if needed first, then speed matching the locomotive, and then syncing the steam chuffs. Loc sound decoders have an auto-tune feature for motor control, which sometimes works great, but I found that this engine ran better with the default settings. I ended up tweaking the default settings manually, making just a couple small adjustments. This locomotive is HO scale, but I speed matched it using the same technique I described in the Model Building Tips DCC speed matching N scale video that's available here on the channel. Loc sound decoders have some of the best chuff sync I've encountered. There are two CVs that control the basic chuff sync. CV57 controls the steam chuffs at the lowest speed setting. CV58 fine tunes the chuffs at higher speeds. I always adjust CV57 first. Most steam locomotives should have four chuffs per driver revolution. The manual recommends using a stopwatch, but I usually just eyeball it. The manual says to adjust CV58 at speed step 4 of 28, which equates to about 14 on my Digitrax throttle. I found that it was helpful to set the throttle a little higher, around 30. I'm really happy with how the headlights turned out. They look good when they're off as well as on, and the silver paint on the back of the lens actually works as a reflector. The model is a smooth runner with great low speed performance that's perfect for a switcher. I'm also happy with the sound. The speaker sounds great and the tender body works as an enclosure. The whistle I picked is playable, meaning that it raises in pitch when you apply more pressure to the F2 key. You need to have a throttle that supports that feature, of course.
In the future, I may do a little weathering on this model, but for now I'm calling it finished. I'm really happy with how this engine turned out, and I'm especially happy with the headlights. I'm going to call it done for now. If you like this video, then please like and subscribe. Stay tuned, and thanks for watching.